Thank you. Um, so I'm Matt Barry. I'm the Chief Executive of Freelancer.com. We're a, um, ASX was Australian Securities Exchange listed company, uh, uh, market cap of about 800 million Canadian dollars. Uh, we run a, a bunch of businesses. One is our, is our Freelancer Marketplace, which is basically a marketplace which is this morning hit 18 million users um, who can get just about any job you can possibly think of done uh, with. So uh, things like build a website, design a logo, you know, design a, get a product manufactured in China, whatever it may be. Uh, we own a couple of businesses. In addition to freelance.com, we own escrow.com, which is a place to buy and sell things securely over the internet. So people are buying and selling things like cars, airplanes, domain names, websites, jewelry, antiques, you name it. And we also own a business called Warrior Forum, which has got a million internet marketers. And it's really the place you go to if you're trying to figure out how to grow your sales, launch a product, uh, figure out how you know, modern internet marketing works in 2016. So things like conversion optimization, SEO, and, and, and so on. But today I want to talk about something you know, completely different. And uh, the title of the talk is How to Not Get Screwed in the Venture Financing. And um, you know, over, over my career, I've raised probably well over $100 million from you know, public sources, private sources, venture capitalists, angel investors, and so forth. And um, you know, along, along the way, I've, I've, through trial and error, uh, I call it A-B testing, uh, I've learned quite a few things. So uh, I thought maybe you might be interested in just, you know, some, of the, some of the things I've learned uh, over the years and maybe how you can apply it if you're thinking about going and raising money. So first of all, pop quiz. What is the best place to raise money from? Is it A, friends, fools, and family? B, angel investors? C, venture capitalists? Or D, the stock exchange? Put your hands up if you think it's A. Friends, fools, and family? B, angel investors? C, venture capitalists? D, the stock exchange? <laughs> how many of you thought it was a trick question? Which it was, none of the above. The best place to raise money from is by selling something useful to customers, right? Uh, you know, start tip number one. A lot of uh, entrepreneurs think, you know, there's all these things that are in the way of me going and starting my business and getting out there. You know, my, my tip to you is just go and do it. A friendly venture capitalist is not the solution to all of your problems. You are the solution to all of your problems. Uh, start number, tip number two comes a little bit from uh, Paul Graham from Y Combinator. He said, just get out there, sell a product, it, you know, get the MVP out there, iterate. Uh, make sure it's something useful customers want to buy and try and get as fast as you can to a, to a level known as startup, uh, as known as run of profitability, which is basically enough uh, money coming in on a monthly basis in order to feed your entire team noodles, right? Because at that point in time, you won't actually need the money anymore so much, right? And you're more of a position of power. So if you go into a negotiation to raise money, you're not there sitting there desperate with, you know, with, with the smell of burning cash every day when you come into work. So start tip number three, if you're a startup CEO, put your hands up if you're a startup CEO in this room or on the founding team. Well, tip number three is you have one job and one job only. Do not run out of cash, right? If you uh, need to raise money, uh, make sure that you raise enough money to go through what we call the valley of death, right? And this is, this is, a, this is, a, this is a place where it's easy to kind of go along and raise a little bit of money from, a, from an incubator or, or an angel investor, $20,000, $50,000 and so forth. But you need to raise enough money to make sure that when you go out there and start executing, you can get to the next demonstrable milestone in the valuation of the company, right? You can't go out there, raise a bit of money, you know, go for a little while and then not actually have that milestone be hit because it'll be absolutely toast for your business, right? And that milestone might be something like, you know, signing the first beta customer. It might be a certain revenue hurdle, um, whatever it may be. But it's got to be something where the valuation, valuation of the business will actually go up, right? If you do not do this, right, and you run out of cash, and I say do not run out of cash, and I want to reiterate, do not run out of cash, right? You'll be in a disaster situation. You know, cash is king. Startup companies rarely survive down rounds, right? And so when you raise your money, you've got to make sure you take into account a thing known as Hofstetter's Law, which is a task always takes longer, even when you take into account Hofstetter's Law. Startup tip number six is, it's easier actually to ask for more money than less money, right? And you have to think about it from an investor's perspective, right? If you think about venture investing, it obeys what they call the power law, right? And to the first approximation, a, a portfolio of investments from a venture capitalist will only make money if one of the investments in that portfolio returns the entire fund, right? You don't have a, you don't have a, 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 a normal distribution of, 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 of um, or a linear distribution of, of success when you invest in startups, right? You typically need one to really return all the money and then the rest is cream, right? And this is why that $100 million fund that you're trying to get $500,000 from is not interested in giving you the money. You know, a, a mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs think is, well, if I ask for less money, it's gonna be easier to raise. So why don't I go to the venture capitalist and ask for $500,000 instead of a lot more money, right? 
So if you do the math on this, right, it doesn't make any sense from the venture capitalist perspective. I used to be a venture capitalist very briefly for a few months before I realized it was the, one of the worst jobs uh, you could possibly have because all you do every day is disappoint entrepreneurs, right? A typical VC fund has you know, a couple of partners. Maybe you, you, know, maybe, 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 maybe you make, um, if, if you're lucky, in the course of a year, two or three investments, right? And the rest of the day, you've got eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours a day where you're meeting entrepreneurs, learning about the great businesses, coming up with all, you know, all sorts of interesting ideas about how they could potentially grow them and you're actually saying no to all of them. Right, um, so if you think about it from a venture capitalist perspective, right, even if you hit the you hit it out of the park with your company, right, and you get a ten x return, which is a phenomenal return for venture capitalists, right, they try they try and really aim for maybe a you know, three five if they're lucky seven times return, right. If you hit it out of the park with a ten times return, right, that's only five million dollar return on a, on on a hundred million dollar fund, right. So that's a 5% return. And what makes it worse is that the typical lifestyle of a venture fund by mandate is somewhere around, say, seven years, sometimes 10 years, right? So that means that the VC is making 5% on their fund over a seven-year period. And for that, they've got to go and spend all the time with you, go to your board meetings, do the strategy sessions, do all the mentoring, do all the introductions to partners, um, to board members, and, and so forth, right? And all they're generating on their $100 million fund is a 5% return, right? That's why they're not interested when you go ask them for $500,000. Right? They've got more, they've got, they'll make more money putting it into a, into a you know, cash management account at 0.2% or 0.3%. So the start tip number eight is, uh, if you do ask for, for more money, right, make sure that every dollar you raise actually goes towards general return on investment. Right? You know, when, you know, my, one of my philosophies about a growing freelancer is, every time I spend a dollar, I make sure that you know, I'm going to make at least a dollar back. Right? There's all these things you can do in a startup to lose focus, right? There's a whole universe of possibilities you can, you can, you know, with things you can do to, to, you know, um, in, a, in a given day, right? But you, you really need to focus on the ones that are actually going to generate return for your business, right? And that's why, if you think about it from an investor's perspective, the good venture capitalists will double down on their winners, right? They want to put as much money to work in those investments as possible, right? So you can look here, for example, at Uber and Benchmark participated in Series A, Series B, Series C, dot, 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 right? You know, you, you, when you find that winner that's going to generate all of, all, you know, bring back all the money in the portfolio back, uh, back to uh, your limited partners, you want to put as much money to work as possible in those winners, right? So from the venture capitalist perspective, the cardinal rule of investing is don't run out of dry powder, right? The minute you run out of dry powder, right, uh, you, you've got no more funds to put, put to pl play in your, good, in, in your winners, that's when, you get, that's when you get screwed, right, as a venture capitalist, right? Because venture, ca venture capital is last in, first out, right? This is otherwise known as the golden rule, right? So the person who last puts his money into, into Uber is the person who's going to be pulling his money out first from Uber, right? The person who puts his money last into Box or Dropbox or wherever it may be, or any of the other unicorns, is the person who'll be pulling it out first. The golden rule is, is other, this is otherwise known as the golden rule because he who has the gold rules, right? The flip side of this is that venture capitalists will cut their losers really quickly, right? If they've got a business that, the good venture capitalists will do this. If they've got a business that's not performing, they'll cut you off. Yeah, you know, pretty brutally, pretty quickly, right? So you want to be really, really careful if you do want to raise money from a venture capitalist, right? That the you know, since the average ma you know, marriage lasts less than the average length of a, of a, of a business and a VC investment, uh, that you, you know, are really, really careful if you do take money from an investor that you've got the, the best match. Preferably, what you want is you want someone who's been an entrepreneur, right? Someone who's been in your industry, who's got you know, you know, you know domain experience, right? So someone who's you know, gone through the ups and downs uh, of, of a life cycle of running a business. I mean, being an entrepreneur, you wake up some morning and I think Elon Musk described it as crawling through broken glass on your hands and knees, you know, crying blood and, and, and so forth. I mean, you know, you, you're out there, you, you're on Struggle Street at the beginning, you, you're trying to get that product out there, customers aren't buying, you, you're trying to figure out why they're not buying. Finally, someone buys, you're on top of the world, right? It's amazing, someone, you know, you've got your first sale. Right? And then, then your server will crash, right? and you lose it, and you go, oh my god, everything's a disaster. Right? And then, then a few more customers will come along, and it's you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. Right? If you have a junior banker as your investor who hasn't operated a business before, right, they'll freak out any time something happens. Right? If you've got an entrepreneur who's run a business before, they know not to get too excited if things are great. Right? So you know, I, my um, major investor in, in freelancer is a guy who sold his business to PC Tools for $300 million. He's actually a couple of years younger than me, believe it or not, and he's retired. But um, you know, you know, when I get really excited you know, in the early years about, about uh, something happening at Freelancer, he said, don't get too excited because you know, if, you, if, you, um, if you come to work in the morning and you don't smell the smell of smoke, you're not sniffing hard enough, right? Everywhere, somewhere is burning. Some, every, every, every day, something is burning somewhere, right? But likewise, if things you know, go horribly wrong, right? And it's, you, know, you think you're, in the, you're down the dumps, you know, he's the guy that says, don't worry about it, tomorrow will be fine. 
these things happen, let's move on, right? If you have a junior banker as your investor, he'll freak out, right? He'll freak out because there is no active market for a venture capitalist to sell their stock in your private company um, uh, that's liquid, has any real liquidity. Yes, there's second market and there's shares post, et cetera, but the liquidity in those markets dried up massively after Facebook, Twitter, and, and so forth went public, right? So as a result, the, the VCs that make an investment in your company kind of get stuck with that investment for a long period of time. And bad venture capitalists won't cut their losses quickly. Bad venture capitalists will actively manage their losers, right? So that's, that's him and that's you, right? Right? So startup tip number nine is do not raise money from venture capitalists. If you do raise money from venture capitalists, make sure they have operating experience, right? Now, most startup founders lose control of the business the second they take the money, right? So the minute they go sign the documentation um, off the back of the term sheet, they absolutely lose control of the business. And I'll, I'll show you now how they lose control of the business on day one, right? First of all, they don't get in a competitive position. So what they do is they go out there and they're talking to a bunch of VCs. And the minute the one VC or one investor shows some interest, they just spend all their time with that investor, right? And what will happen is that investor will do, you know, do sessions with the team. They'll go, let's meet the founding team. Let's learn the strategy of the business. Okay, tell me about the market. What's your go-to-market go -go strategy? What's your exit strategy? All this sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, the investor will get to a point where they go, oh, I'm ready to drop a term sheet. Right? A term sheet comes out. And the problem at that point is, because this, the, 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 the startup has spent so much time with that one investor, they've got no one else. Right? And to get anyone fired up and down the pipeline is going to take weeks, if not months. Right? So they get stuck with one term sheet and that's it and they get screwed, right? What you have to do is you kind of have to shop, you know, shop to your drop, right? You kind of have to go out there and get multiple investors moving down the pipeline at the same rate. If one investor gets too far ahead of everyone else, you kind of have to slow them, back, slow them down a little bit and get the other guys up to speed. Because what you need, right, is when, you drop that, when that term sheet drops, you need to be able to go to investor number two and investor number three and say, and a term sheet just came out, or a term sheet that kind of come out next, next Monday or next Friday, or wherever it is, I need you, if you're interested, to drop a term sheet and be in a position ready to do that. And they won't be able to do that until they've got, gone through all the checks and balances they have in telling them their fund. The partners have to, have, to, have to not veto it. They've got to have to have an investment, um, a little um, paper that they write that they pre present to the investment committee as justification of why they're going to do this investment and so forth. And if they're not prepared to do that because you've literally only had one or two meetings with them and that's it, you'll get screwed because they simply will go, we'll have to sit, the, sit this one out and wait till next round because we're just not ready to get going. So you need to get all the investors moving down the pipeline at the same rate, right? If you have one term sheet, you'll get screwed. If you have two term sheets, you can get maybe in a bit of a competitive position. If you have three, you will start getting a good deal, right? There are other tricks you can play. There are tricks you can play you can't lie, absolutely. Is, absolutely you can't uh, say anything that's not, not true, but there are things you can do potentially if you have inside investors, such as you know, considering maybe doing an internal round. Um, you know, you know, uh, you know, we're not quite sure if we'll take external money and, and so forth. There's ways you can kind of create the illusion of time scarcity or supply scarcity in the stock, uh, but you've got to make sure you always tell, uh, tell the truth. Now, what VCs use as a weapon against all of you is what a thing called information asymmetry. And that is, you guys uh, are startup founders, you probably haven't done many rounds of venture capital, um, uh, uh, or maybe some, some of you have, but not, not all of you. Um, venture capitalists all day, every day, just sit there st staring at the docs, staring at their spreadsheet and so forth. And there's quite a sophisticated structure that they've come up with in terms of how they do, do their financings, right? And, and one of the, most, one of the biggest um, uh, things that um, uh, startups do wrong which leads to the complete loss of control in the business on day one that uh, is actually not read the documentation, right? The documentation you sign off comes off the back of a thing called a term sheet. The term sheet may be, may be four, six, eight pages long. The documentation that comes off the back of the term sheet will be a telephone directory thick, right? And most startups don't, don't read every line of that documentation. You need to read every line of the documentation. The reason why you contract is for two scenarios. Either you'll make a lot of money and everyone wants to see you, or you'll lose a lot of money and everyone wants to see you, right? That's where all the terms kick in and then that, that documentation. And if you don't read it, what will happen is in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years down the track, when something happens like an exit and you go, what did I agree to back five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago? And you go, oh, holy shit, what did I agree to that, right? You need to understand that documentation very, very clearly. Now, a couple, here's a couple, of, a couple of ways in this term sheet um, that simply that, um, that a venture capitalists use a information asymmetry to, to get complete control on day one. A very simple one is a thing called board composition, right? Now, when I was starting out, I was very confused as a first-time CEO about what the role of a CEO was and what the role of a board was, right? You know, you're there, you're desperate to raise money, finally someone's giving you some money, they're older, they're more experienced, you go, oh, 
that's fantastic. Um, you know, and I kind of thought early on, mistakenly, that the board ran the business. The board does not run the business, right? The CEO runs the business. The board has one role in a startup, um, and that is to basically hire and fire the CEO, right? If they, uh, one guy, a guy, a guy once told me, a very experienced Silicon Valley veteran um, entrepreneur told me, if you listen to the board, uh, if you do not listen to the board, you may or may not get fired, right? If you do listen to the board, at some point in time, you probably will get fired, right? Um, and so what, what this guy, when I was going through a pretty dark time where I wasn't quite sure I had, had a lot of conflict between the, the investors on my board and I wasn't quite sure what I should do or who I should take orders from, et cetera. And he said, just go and execute, right? If you execute well, everything will, will, will come, come good, right? But if you sit there and get involved in all of this, it can, it can be a complete disaster. They said, trust me, if they have a problem with what you're doing, they'll just terminate your employment, right? Yes, boards do other things. They, 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 um, there are other things they do, and particularly as you get as a bigger company like my company, which is publicly listed. You know, there's audit committees and a bunch of other things that, that they do. But you know, in, a, in a very, very early stage startup, it basically they're there to hire for other CEO, um, along with you know, mentoring them, right? Um, while a board's job is not to, to not to run the company, it actually has effective control because you can fire the CEO and appoint a new management team. In fact, you can also um, resolve to a, uh, a new business plan for the business, which is return all cash to the shareholders. So if you lose control of the board, you lose control of the company, which is basically a game over scenario. Now, when you think about the board, you should always have an odd number. You should have an odd number so you can make decisions, right? Uh, if you have an even number, sometimes you get deadlock. Uh, in some, some jurisdictions, the chairman ha can have a casting vote, but you know, keep the board small, keep the board odd. The best number for a startup is three. After that, the best number is five, right? If you're a startup pre-revenue, you shouldn't have a board not more than five people, right? Now, how directors are normally determined in a, in a company that's not, um, that doesn't have a preferred stock structure. So if you have a company which has um, got um, uh, common stock in the case of the US or ordinary shares in the case of Australia or, or the United Kingdom, right? The way that directors are normally determined is that you have a vote of all the shareholders. It's one share, one vote, right? And for every director, you have a vote and that vote determines, right? If, you, if the votes come in greater than 50% for a particular person being nominated to be a director, they are now a director, right? So um, if you have a $2 million uh, financing in a company, it's a, it's a, it's a private company, that has a six million pre-money, so it's, you know, the post is eight, so 25% is sold to investors, right? And the founders, who would still own 75% of the business, would determine uh, the board, because every single director, when it gets voted on, the founders have more than 50% of the stock, right? That's how things happen in the normal world, right? Um, now, this is how board control is immediately lost uh, when you do a venture financing. So this is, comes from a term sheet that, was, that I actually signed that was provided to me many, many years ago by a venture capitalist. And it seems quite reasonable on first glance. It says the board of directors shall have five people. Okay, odd number, that's good. Two directors shall be des designated by the investors. Two shall be designated by the holders of majority of the shares of the company's common stock. And uh, one uh, independent director, unaffiliated with the company, Shall, which shall be approved by both the holders, the majority of the preferred shares, and the majority of the shares, the common stock voting as a separate class. Um, so uh, immediately, this, the way this works is as follows. There's five board seats, two board seats go to the venture capitalists, two go to everyone else, and there's an independent. But the VCs have the rights, uh, veto rights over who that independent person is. So they can sit there and just say veto, 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 veto until they're happy about the particular person that, that goes in, right? And effectively what happens at that point is, uh, there's an old joke which is uh, in, the, in, the, in the public markets world, which is what's the difference between a shopping trolley and a non-executive director? And you fill both with food and a grog, but a shopping trolley at least has a mind of its own. The good thing about independent directors is the more you pay them, the more independent they get. Uh, refer to startup tip number five, the golden rule, who has the gold rules? The venture capitalists have the money. The independents know that they have to, you know, tacitly, uh, generally speaking, uh, go along with what the VCs say if they're going to preserve their role on the board. So this is a very, you know, looks, some, looks you know, at first glance, five, five, five board members, two go to the VCs, two go to the original founders of the company. You think that's quite reasonable. Okay, independent in the middle, what can be more fair than that? Boom, on day one, your control of the business is completely gone. Once, once the VCs control the board, they can do a bunch of other things, you know, fire the CEO, change the business plan, whatever it may be. That's game over. Okay, let's look at the allocation of returns on an exit, right? So there's a thing called liquidation preference, which I think is a particularly insidious uh, term which is uh, uh, fairly complicated uh, in uh, first glance, but actually quite simple if you, if, if you think about it. And this is, this is basically um, a mechanism by which the venture capitalist can give you any valuation you want, right? They can make up a valuation, right? And, um, but the valuation has no bearing 
on how the returns get paid out on an exit of the business. That's an IPO, or, or, or as in this case, actually, it's a trade sale, not an IPO, right? So, you know, th there's a, a whole bunch of uh, complicated text. This is just in the term sheet. It gets more sophisticated, actually, in the, in the, in the financing documents. But basically, to summarize this, it says, in a trade sale or a wind-up, which basically is two scenarios. You're selling the company to some other company, right? Or you're winding up the business because you, you want to shut it down. It's not in the case of an IPO, and I'll talk about later what hap happens in an IPO. This is a term sheet that was given to me that I actually signed first time around when I raised money. It said the hold holders of the, of the preferred stock, the Series A preferred stock, this is the stock that venture capitalists buy, get two and a half times their money back first, and then the remaining proceeds will be shared uh, pro rata, right? And so let's, let's think this through. So let's say you're raising $2 million in a $6 million pre-money evaluation. So that's our previous example where you know, normally the founders would keep 75% and, and the VCs take 25%, right? If you think about the distribution of returns, in a $5 million exit, right? Now, $2 million has gone in. There's a two and a half times um, participating preferred liquidation preference, which means off the top, before anything happens in the distribution returns, $5 million goes to the venture capitalists, right? So if you sell for $5 million or less, you get zero, right? Above that, uh, you've got different scenarios. You can, you can do the math on it. Uh, on a $10 million exit, um, you know, the, the VCs get 62.5% you know, you know, of, of the returns, and the founders get 37%. On a $40 million, that's only when the founders start getting uh, start getting the lion's share of, of the returns. Now, that's not the bad bit. The bad bit is what happens when you go raise money from the next round of investors and the third round of investors, the Series A, the Series B, Series C, and in some circumstances, I think Uber's up to Series J or, or Z or Q or something, right? The problem is the next investor that comes along will want at least as good terms as the first guy that came in, right? Because of the golden rule. Right? The, the next investor coming along has got a bigger sack of money, bigger pot of gold. Right? They've got at least as good a deal as, as, as the Series A, unless the Series A hasn't run out of dry powder. Right? If the Series A hasn't run out of dry powder, they could offer an alternative term sheet, right? and they can negotiate their position uh, relative to the Series B. Right? Or not do a deal with the Series B at all. They could, they could just come along and say, Here, you know, we'll, we'll do the whole thing ourselves. And, and basically, you get, get, you get to a situation of a competitive position, right? But let's say you, you, you do your $2 million on, on, on your $6 million pre in the Series A, and then you go to do your Series B, and you're raising 10 on a pre of 30, right? So again, you're giving up 25% of the business, right? Because it's 30 pre, 10 comes in, the post is 40. So it's 10 on 40. In this scenario, right, if they have a two and a half times liquidation preference, the Series B, and the Series A has a two and a half times liquidation preference, you have a total of $12.5 million, which has liquidation preference of 2.5x on it, right? right? So you, in, in, this, in this scenario, in a, thir, uh, in a um, uh, yeah, 12 million, you, have 20, you have $25 million liquidation preference, which means that um, below, um, sorry, the $30 million, uh, sorry, there's $30 million liquidation preference in a, in a exit of $30 million, the Series A will get five million, and the Series B will get twenty-five million, and the founders will get zero. Right? So you have to sell your business for at least thirty million dollars. Right? And a sixty million dollar exit, the Series A will get a bit over ten million dollars. Ten million dollars. The Series B will get thirty-two million dollars, and the founders will get sixteen million dollars. And a hundred million dollars exit, that's where, that's where the founders start making about uh, make about forty million dollars. So this stacks Series A, B, C, D, etc. I've seen companies with hundreds of millions of dollars liquidation preference. Right? where if the business sells for 100, 200, 300 million dollars, the founders get zero. So would you like to be a unicorn? <laughs> I'll give you 100 million dollars on a pre evasion of a billion dollars, no sweat, with a two times participating preferred liquidation preference, which means that if you sell the business for less than 200 million dollars, you get zero, right? So you can see how these, these unicorn valuations came about. This the things like liquidation preference, right? This is a game over scenario. A trick that you can use in, in your arsenal when you go and negotiate with investors is to understand what is market in the terms that go into a term sheet. There's a law firm in the US in Silicon Valley called Fenwick and West. Fenwick and West publish a quarterly report. That quarterly report will tell you what in all the deals that happened last quarter and the quarter before and the quarter before, what were the standard terms going into these term sheets? Was it a one times liquidation preference, two times liquidation preference? Was it participating? Was it non participating? Etc. And so on. So it's always good to have read this report to know what is market. Because then an investor gives you a non market term sheet, you can just say to them, Do you think we're a good business? You go, Of course we think you're a good business. Then why are you giving me a non market deal? This is a market deal, right? So this is a powerful thing you can use in your, in your arsenal to, to protect yourself. Now remember, I talked about down rounds. What's a down round? A down round is when 
you raise money at a valuation that is equal to or less than the, than the round that you raised previously for, uh, at, right? And the, 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 the companies rarely survive this scenario. I actually can't really think of any companies that have survived this scenario. They, at, at best, they'll kind of zombie along for many, many years and eventually wind up, right? There's a, term, there's, a, there's, a, there's a clause in the term sheet known as anti-dilution, right? And um, you know, basically the way it works, if the corporation issues or is deemed to have issued additional common shares for an amount of share that's less than the conversion price in effect immediately before the issuance of shares of the preferred shares, the conversion price for that uh, series shall automatically be reduced to the amount per share of the consideration per share of the additional common shares. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you go raise money at, and do a down round, right, the VC converts as if they bought in at that down round. Right? So what that, this is absolutely brutal. So let's take the scenario, you've raised $2 million in a $6 million pre, right? So you've got 25% went out to the Series A. And then say you had a down round, where you just took a $1 million of bridging finance. You've all heard about these companies, always took a bit of bridging money in to like, get us along a little bit, right? $1 million of bridging, it's our $3 million pre money, right? So, you, so the valuation's gone down, you've taken a little bit of money in, you're still giving out 25% because it's one on three, right? So if you look at the pie, right? Now, uh, on a $7.5 million exit or less, right, um, the Series A will get $5 million, the Series B will get $2.5 million because both are assumed to have bought in at a $3 million valuation. Right? And it's, you can see the founders, is, it's completely brutal for the founders at this point. And particularly if you do multiple rounds after that, it's, I mean, the company's gone. This is a game over scenario, right? There's another thing that's going on in the valley, which is kind of interesting, which is known, I call it the greater fool theory, right? Um, which is the intersection between doing something dumb and hoping something else is dumber, right? And the way this works is, uh, if you look out there, um, there's a lot of uh, companies that go out there and they, they, they raise like uh, $50 million. And they go t take that $50 million and they spend it on marketing, right? And they make back $35 million, right? And they show a really, really steep revenue ramp. And then they go raise $100 million and they spend it on marketing and they make back, you know, $75 million, and they show this tremendous revenue ramp, right? And they go raise half a billion dollars, and they spend it on the marketing, they make back $250 million. And they show this, you know, and they go, this is the fastest growing company in the history of mankind, and, and so forth, and the VCs go crazy, look how fast this company is growing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? This is known as the greater fool theory, right? Um, there was a leaked document that came out about Uber uh, when they did a convertible note issue about it a year or two ago that showed for every dollar that Uber spent on marketing, they're making 80, 85 cents back. Um, there's a talk on YouTube, um, I think it's on YouTube now, which my VP of Growth gives, which goes through all the publicly listed um, uh, unicorns that have come out and, and goes through and analyzes for every dollar that they spend on marketing what their actual return is. And you'll see you know, 40 cents in the dollar, 60 cents in the dollar, 55 cents in the dollar, 60 cents in the dollar, right? And this is the greater fool theory, which is you go raise tons and tons and tons of money and, 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 and grow the pie really, really big, right? And so this comes to the concept of dilution, right? Where you kind of, you know, the VCs will tell you, uh, don't worry about dilution. You know, you're growing the pie bigger, right? You're raising more and more money at a bigger valuation. That's great, isn't it, right? And it's, you know, it's much better to have a small part in a really big thing than a, a big part of a really small thing. Well, this is what happens when you do this. Box went public, and uh, it's a great company. I don't say anything bad about the company. And, and Aaron Levy is a good, great guy, and I'm not saying anything bad about him. But when you go and raise series A, B, C, D, E, F, G, on top of the angel, right? Uh, you end up in a scenario where you go public and you're the CEO and founder of the company and 3.4% of the business total, right? And that's horrible for a lot of reasons. It's not just horrible because you put all your, your life into this thing and not many people can, can do more than one company in their lifetime, but it's, it's horrible because you've lost all your control provisions, right? Your ability to block anything on a vote is gone. You are basically there as an indentured slave or, or servant of the, of, of the, of the, of the, of the investors. Um, at Freelancer, we did something completely different. I, my previous company, I did that. I did that. My, my previous company, I raised Series A, B, C, D, what have you, went down the venture route. I was assembling board meetings with 16 people in them. There weren't 16 people on the board, but with all the alternate uh, and shadow directors and so forth, I had to assemble 16 people to do a board meeting. And you know, at the end of the day, six years later, I kind of wondered why I had no shares in the business, right? With Freelancer, I did things uh, differently. Um, and I took in uh, $2.5 million in a convertible note up front to buy a business that was already um, making money, a million dollars a year in revenue. And I optimized the hell out of that. I didn't raise a single dollar from anyone until I IPO'd the company in November 2013, uh, which was at a $200 million valuation, right? And as a result of that, when I IPO'd the company, I owned uh, about 50% of the business, right? Uh, which, you know, uh, it was lucky in some regards, but you know, it, it just reflects what happens if you have a different philosophy. 
The reality is about dilution, it's basically unprofitable wealth transfer from you to the venture capitalists, right? On top of you losing um, you know, your, your, your stake, stake, in the, stake in the business in terms of your financial return, you lose control thresholds, voting thresholds, you know, board seats and so forth, just simply because you get whittled down to, to minority uh, uh, shareholding. That's another game over scenario. There's another thing in these term sheets known as ratchets, right? And um, the way ratchets work, it's, uh, you, you might remember seeing pictures of, when you were in high school of medieval times and people on, a, on, on the rack being stretched. This is how a ratchet works, right? And a, ra a ratchet basically means that the venture capitalists, when they stick their money in, their shares will convert dependent upon some performance metric of the business, right? And this is a way, ratchets are a way that VCs often try and bridge valuation gaps between founders and, um, and, and uh, themselves. So you'll go, oh no, I want a $50 million valuation. They'll go, no, I'll give you a $20 million valuation. And you go, well, I'm gonna make all this revenue next year and the year after, and they go, well, fine. If you hit those targets, we'll give you your valuation. But for every dollar, a million dollars you miss, we're gonna ratchet our shares up by a certain percentage, right, in terms of conversion. Right, so the onus is on you to perform, and you get, and, the, and then you get stuck as a as a founder because you're like, you've got this not optimistic, you know, really optimistic valuation. Uh, I'm sorry, optimis optimistic view of the business and how it's going to perform, but now it's on upon you to deliver, or you end up losing the whole business. Right, and um, so, uh, you know, uh, if you look, at, for example, at Box.net, and again, I don't want to say anything bad about Box because uh, uh, you know, uh, but the guys there because they're, they're doing good good things, but in the Series F that they raised, A B C D F. Uh, EF, um, there was a provision where the shares uh, that were sold in the Series F uh, ratcheted uh, at IPO to a minimum of $20 a share or 90% of the IPO price. So there was a baked in minimum return, right? So if the IPO came out, there was a baked in minimum, um, uh, effectively 11% pop, uh, right? But furthermore, if, if, if the share price that was set when it went public was less than $20, the share price would be $20, right? Now, that was one ratchet. There was a second ratchet, which would have made life very unpleasant for Aaron, right? And that is that a time-based ratchet, which said, you've got to IPO the company by July 7th, 2015. And if you don't, this Series F gets $3 in value per share every 360 days paid quarterly. So every day that he had an IPO of the company, just ratcheted up the value of the investor's shares. So that's, that's horrible, as a time ratchet, and then, then there, was, there was also a price ratchet, right? Now, the, the, the ironic thing about this is the IPO price of Box is $14 a share. So the Series F converted at $12.60, which is 11.1% uh, premium, uh, would, you know, would have converted that, but, but because it has a minimum of $20, it came out at, at $20. Ironically, the Box share price actually opened up at $20.20, right? And there's all the text here. There's $150 million, basically, at $20 a share that came out. Uh, of this, right? And if he didn't, if he didn't list it when he did, it would have been even worse. Now, the funny thing that's happened while this is going on with the, with the, with the ratchets is, there's, there's, in, in, in the greater full theory, is that as you're going to find more and more new investors to go uh, to go uh, raise capital from, you kind of run out of investors eventually. You go to all the early stage guys, and you go to all the the, the, the mezzanine guys and the growth guys, and you go to the late stage guys. And eventually, you've, you've run out of people to raise money from, but you need to feed the beast, right? So you need to raise bigger and bigger amounts of money to kind of fuel this revenue, ramp, this unprofitable revenue ramp. So what a number of companies did thinking they were smart was they thought, let's go find the greater fool, right? And where did they go? They went to the public markets because you've got companies like, uh, big funds like uh, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, and so forth. They have huge amounts of money. And for them, sticking you know, $50 million into a business is, is chump change. It's a rounding error for them, right? So they went out there and they raised money from Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, uh, Vanguard, and so forth. These are people who are traditionally only public markets players, right? Which created a really, really perverse situation. And the worst of both worlds, they were still private, but all of a sudden they had floating stock prices. And the reason they had floating stock prices is because these fund managers would mark to market, right? So every month, the portfolio managers would look at their portfolio of private company, illiquid venture-backed uh, investments, and they'll come up with a share price. So that these companies would end up having a floating share price and still be private. So there'd be no active market for the stock, but the, the share price would still float, right? And this is, this is, a, this is a complete disaster for a, for a lot of the companies. Dropbox just had, its, um, uh, had Fidelity mark down its um, share price by 50%. And that happened off the basis that Box went public and Box's IPO has been a, a disaster. 
uh, and it, it's dropped uh, quite significantly. So now Dropbox can't go public because their share price has been marked to market by Fidelity. It's been halved, right? So if, if, if you know Fidelity has on the books for say you know $10 and you're trying to IPO at $20, how can you do that? You can't do it, right? Because these reports are public, right? So if you look at Square, Square had the same thing. Square, the Square's IPO had an had a IPO price range of $11 to $13. It was priced at $9, which was under the range. The ratchet for the Series E was $18.56. So each Series E uh, guy basically got two shares for nothing. And then ironically, on day one, the IPO pops and opens up at $14, right? You do the math on that, Fidelity made it like a bandit, right? They, they, had, they had shares that you know, they thought were going to come out at $9 and they ended up having shares come out at uh, their shares come out at 1856 which then went up uh, from there now perversely it's actually in the best interest to Fide of fidelity and TRO price for these companies to bomb on the IPO right on the pricing of the IPO because once you get set right and you've got your ratchet you're going to convert anyway at a minimum price or with a with a with a premium uh, a premium on, on whatever the price is issued at right so it's actually in your best interests I'm not saying anyone's done this, but it's actually in the Fidelity and TRO Price's interests to mark down the companies as much as possible on the books, right? Because once that ratchet's in place, they're going to make out like bandits on the IPO, right? And that's possibly why, one explanation why, uh, these shares popped so well on, on opening is they were priced really, really low. Everyone said there's no demand for the shares at the IPO price they were marketing them at. So they got priced way, way, way under, but then remarkably on, on day one, bang, there's this huge support in the market for the shares, right? And if, 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 I, if, if, uh, you know, if I was cynical, I would say, well, you know, that worked out really, really well for the, the late stage guys, right? Worked out really, really well. So very perverse. So I think we uh, forgot the golden rule there, which is um, yeah, he who has the gold rules and uh, Fidelity, Tiro Price, etc. They've got a lot of money to put to work and certainly they can provide a lot of aftermarket support. So game over there. There are 152 unicorns collectively valued at $532 billion. Anyone worried about that at all? Um, furthermore, what else goes into term sheets? Well, things like management controls and vetoes. So this is from a term sheet I signed. Um, and what it basically says is that there are certain actions that if the company takes these, uh, you need to have uh, approval from the investors. All right? This is not by a board vote. This is not by a shareholder vote. It is basically veto pure and simple by the investors like you know, unless you get a yes from them you can't you can't do it and in this it said uh, basically uh, there was vetoes over approval of the annual business plan any material deviance uh, departure from the from uh, uh, de uh, departure from the business plan any decision to uh, IPO the company any proposal to uh, carry on the um, um, to, to cease to carry on the part of the business wind anything up or spin anything out um, the sale of any part of the business uh, transfer of any intellectual property, licensing of any intellectual property, any transactions in the court, other than transactions in the ordinary course of business, creation of any committee of the board or company of any subsidiary, de delegation of any powers to anyone or any subsidiary, the appointment or removal of any CEO, um, any issuance of any increase of shares reserved under the company's stock option program, any acquisitions, uh, hiring of, uh, and so forth. On top of that, there was spending over $100,000 individually in aggregate or in aggregate, borrowing of over $50,000, hiring or firing of the CFO, CTO, COO, VP of sales, VP of marketing, transfers of shares, mortgages or securities, leases, remuneration of any executive over 100 grand, which is pretty much uh, anyone in their senior team, variation of any superannuation incentive, share or bonus scheme, payments or transfer of assets, and at the end, just to make sure they cover themselves, any agreement you sign. No soup for you. I, in fact, know of one well-known Australian startup whose investors actually vetoed the travel budget so the CEO could not travel to the US to raise the Series B. And they said, uh, we're calling, calling an emergency board meeting and your travel budget is now zero, right? So you can't travel overseas to raise any money from the Series B because they wanted to make sure that the next round of financing, they were the, they were the only option. Uh, luckily, she paid for it uh, for herself. Uh, it's a game over fatality. Uh, and actually managed to find some good people who did a reset. So refer again to the, the golden rule, who has the gold rules. So my tip here is do not raise money from venture capitalists and uh, sell something to customers. And if you do uh, raise money from venture capitalists, make sure they're operating experience, uh, make sure you get yourself in a competitive position, uh, read and understand every single line of that term sheet and start CEOs, you have one job and one job only, do not run out of cash. Thank you. I guess I'm happy to answer any questions you have about any of this. Um, don't be shy. Yep, from the front. Um, so you talked about how you were supposed to ask for more money than what you actually 
Mm -hmm. But isn't that bad because that means that you have to deliver what you got? Um, so, it, so there's a lot of contradictory things being said uh, here. So number one is, I, from, a, from a venture capitalist perspective, what I'm saying is it's easier to ask for more money than less money because when a venture capitalist thinks about the investment, they think about, well, if this company gets a 10 times return or a five times return, how's it, you know, what's the return of my fund going to be? So therefore, should I do it or not, right? So, so on one hand, I'm saying it's easier to ask for more money than less money. On the other hand, I'm saying the more you dilute, the worse it is for you. So the middle ground is make sure that you have a plan for every single dollar you raise, right? But the other thing is you need to think about the type of funds you're going to, the type of investors you're going to, and how much money they've got to work. I mean, in the Series A for my first company, I went to Deutsche Bank. And I said, oh, well, I just asked for $500,000, right? $500,000 is less money, so it's less risky for them, less downside for them if something goes wrong. Surely it's going to be easier to take an investment from them. And they said, we're not interested. It's just too small. And I said, well, I, I, can raise, I can do it with a million. They go, oh, it's still too small. So I said, how about four million? And they said, no, we're interested all of a sudden. And nothing had changed. It was like literally in the space of about 45 minutes, I'd gone from asking for $500,000 to $4 million. And all of a sudden, they were really, really interested in the business. And nothing had changed about the business. It's just asked for more money and suddenly got interested because they could do the math and they go, okay, well, we can put four million to play and we're going to get a good return then, right? Uh, so you need, to be, you need to be careful. I mean, as I said, I mean, the golden rule is, uh, well, not the golden rule, but the, you know, the, the number one rule I have here is actually don't raise money at all if you can't help it. Just go out there and sell something, get some, money, you know, get some revenue in, get to that first point where you can pay for noodles for everyone, right? And you can just survive, right? And at that point, you can relax because when you're coming into the business, Every day in a, in a cash, uh, cash flow negative business, like I did my first, I, I built semiconductors uh, uh, for um, high speed pat matching and network traffic. Uh, the company ultimately sold to Intel, but it took a long time to do so and it was, wasn't, it wasn't really a spectacular success um, while it was private. But, um, you know, every day I came to work, I had this smell, right? And it was just, it was stench was everywhere. And it's a smell of burning money, right? And when you're, when you're burning money every day, it's a really, really stressful situation because you're there going, okay, how long does it take to raise money? Three months, six months, maybe nine months, maybe more. Some companies have been, fund I know guys have been fundraising for six years, still haven't raised the money, right? And they really should probably give up and do something else. But, but you, know, it's, it, you know, normally bank on six to nine months. So you come to work and you go, okay, it'll take me six to nine months to raise money, right? So when do I need to go out there and actually start hitting the trail, right? Because, you know, if I've got 12 months of cash left, I've got to start seriously thinking about ramping up in three to six months, go out there and, and, and hitting the trail, right? And this is why, uh, there's another slide that somehow fell out of this presentation, which is a thing called tranching, right? I don't know if any of you guys have experienced with tranching, where you, you go to an investor, you say, I want to raise $2 million. And they say to you, um, well, we're not quite sure about this, whatever. Um, how about we give you $1 million now, but we'll give you $1 million if you hit, hit certain milestones, right? In six months or 12 months, or whatever. And you go, oh, okay, fine. I guess it's up to me to kind of hit the milestones. It seems quite reasonable, but that's, that's an absolute death, right? And the reason it's absolute death is because normally when you, when you raise money to fund your business, you raise about 18 months worth of cash. And the reason why is in that first nine months, you don't want to be out there fundraising, right? So, you, so in the last nine months, maybe you're out there fundraising, right? And you want to make sure in the 18 months of cash that you hit some milestone, some real milestone that will mean that someone will pay more per share for your business than, than, than previously. When they tranche you, you end up underfunded. You end up with nine months cash. So you go out there and you raise, you raise, you raise, trying to raise two million, you get one million, right? You get nine months cash. You start work, you go, hang on a tick. Fundraising is going to take six to nine months. I have to start fundraising again on day one, right? And fundraising is an incredibly distracting thing to do, right? You're out there and you're knocking on doors and you get a lot of rejections and whatever. And you know, it's, it's pretty soul destroying in certain ways as well because you, you're begging, right? But um, it's, it's horrible from a, from a company's perspective because on, literally on the day you take the money, you've got to go out there fundraise again. Because what always happens in these tranching scenarios is, is unless those milestones are so clear, like so cut and dry, black and white, the company is always going, I'm not quite sure whether we're, we're going to pass this milestone or not, right? Because the, 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 the condition might be like a, a positive reference from a customer, right? For, or from a tier one customer. And what's tier one mean? You know, maybe, maybe you get a reference, is, is this customer I get a reference from good enough? Is it positive enough? You know, et cetera. So the startup, you know, I've been there, just, you, you sit there and you just go, uh, we're not quite sure whether the investor's gonna stick the money in or not. And the investors, some investors, bad investors will, will, will play on that and they'll go, well, you know, you're not going so well, we'll have to see in a few months where they put the rest of the money in, whatever. And they're doing that to try and negotiate their, their strength in, in, in terms of the negotiation. But it, it's, it's actually, it's a terrible situation to be in from a startup perspective. Any questions? Yep. Um, about uh, freelancer and holding on to as much of it as you can um, before going public. Yeah. Um, you did reveal that you 
percent mm -hmm. by the time you went public. Mm -hmm. Can you give any insight of you know you had a certain stance and you wanted to hold as much of it for as long as possible? Yep. What happened to that fifty percent? Why? Okay. Well, what happened was I um, I raised money early on. So as a long story cut short, I. I had a venture-backed business, which I ran for many, many years, raised about 30 million in venture capital for a semiconductor business. Had a whole bunch of VCs that were toxic, they were fighting with each other and fighting with us. The business didn't set the world on fire. We are building gigabit chips in a world where there were no gigabit networks. It was like 2001, so there were very few networks out there. It said market failure, product fit failure, we should have put it in a box and sold the boxes and built an enterprise sales team, but we were too afraid to. Uh, a whole bunch of things went wrong uh, with the business, but the technology was great and the people were great, right? Um, and so when I left that business after, after many, many years, I was like, gee, how do I, how do I, um, how do I start another business, right? And I, that first million dollars in revenue that you'll make is the hardest million you'll ever make, right? When you, when you have less than a million in revenue, you've got no real, you know, if you've got like an internet business, for example, you've got no traffic to your website. So you can't do things like A-B testing because none of the stats will be statistically significant, right? You, get, you go, you look at your website, you get one hit. You change something on your website, you get another hit. <laughs> You know, it's like you, you don't know, you, don't, you, can't, you can't tell if, if something's good or bad, right? You're sitting there, you're, doing, you're constantly doing like AA testing, right? Um, and so it's just that first million is really, really, really tough and it takes a long time. Once you've got a million in revenue, you can start doing things. Should I try this? Should I try doing that? Should I, you know, if you're doing enterprise sales, should I change something in the way I structure my contract? So, you know, and you, you can start doing testing because and, and, you've actually got some, a little bit of moment, momentum. So when I, I was pretty broken after six years of running a business and walking out on it um, that I thought, that first million, I just can't start from scratch and do it again. So I actually, it's a long story cut short. It's online if you want to, there's, there's a whole bunch of videos on, online where I talk about the story. It's, um, there's, a, there's a good one called, Sun, there's a Sunrise video series where I talk about the history of the company. It's actually quite interesting. But, um, but I went out there, I bought a business that's doing a million in revenue. And um, that cost me a fair chunk up front, but I got it from a, a good guy who had just sold his business, who was a friend of mine. And um, so that's where the other half went. Yep. When you don't need it, for a starting point, um, when you're in a position of strength and when you're in a competitive position, right? Um, look, it depends what industry you're in. Not this, this doesn't use universally apply to everything. Like if you're doing a, a hardware sort of business or a biotech business, etc., you might some, sometimes might need a lot of infrastructure in terms of uh, build out or inventory, and it, and that that can be really tough. That's why I won't touch hardware businesses ever again. Uh, I think things like consumer software, you know, particularly marketplaces, can, software, the marginal cost of software is zero. And when it's a website, like software as a service, whatever, there's one copy of the software, right? So it's, it's brilliant. You update the software once and it's done, right? Um, but, you know, if you, you know, it, does, it doesn't work for everyone. Um, but, you know, if you um, do need to go and raise money, just get in a position where you've got some sort of strength, right? You've got something to show for yourself. You've got some customer testimonials. You've got maybe some traction with some customers, preferably you're actually slightly profitable. You may only be doing 20,000 a month in revenue. That 20,000 a month in revenue is just paying for your four team members to you know, live in a, in, a, in a crappy little place and eat noodles and pay for the internet connection, right? Or you, you know, the cost for a desk at a co-working space or whatever it may be, because it just gives you time, right? When you, when you go from cash flow negative to cash flow positive, you're in a situation where you're not desperate on a certain date. You know, you're going to drop dead, so you're desperate to go out there and do any deal you can. When you've, got, when you've got the luxury of saying, I can just wait another day and there'll be a few more dollars left in the bank, uh, added to the bank, but it, not a lot. You just, it, you, even your whole demeanor, you have just a whole, whole more confidence in, in terms of how you go out there in, in, in your fundraising process. Yep. Do you have any advice for early stage companies that are getting acquisition interest from larger companies and kind of things to watch out for and have? Yeah, so most of the, so most of the interest from, from larger companies in acquisition is, is just them having a sniff, right? Um, you know, I've got a team and we've got 250 companies we're looking at at any point in time. We're not going to buy 250 of them. We might buy one or two a year, right? So, you know, it, you know, it's good to see that it's good that someone will come to you and say, oh, I'm interested in taking a look, but they're just there to kind of put you on the radar, put you on the sheet and figure out, are you big enough or meaningful enough for, you know, for them to buy, right? I mean, if the company's really large, <coughs> you either have to have a fantastic product that they're going to use, um, a meaningful revenue stream that's going to mean something that's going to be accretive to their earnings, um, or it's an aqua hire, right? Um, so, I mean, a lot of the time, um, they're just wanting to put it on the radar and, you know, 
it's, it's kind of funny. There's a lot of businesses we look at where, where after I talk to the, the, the founder and say, I say to them, frankly, you're just too small for us to even consider buying you, but I really hope that you get it to maybe three or five million a year in revenue and then talk to me because you'll actually be in my sweet spot where it might mean something to me. But you better do it in the next two years because if you don't, I want 10 million in revenue. So, you know, so look, don't be, don't be, um, <coughs> um, if, they, if they approach you, just talk to them. Be, be, be open with your stats. Don't be, you know, everyone, you know, a lot of founders you talk to, they're very secretive. They won't even, won't even tell you the revenue number because it's some sort of commercial and confidence thing. I, mean, I met with a startup in the UK this last month. I said, I'm interested in buying your business. Um, and they said, oh, that's great. I said, okay, we'll just, I just need some basic information in order to give you a, value, a rough valuation. How much revenue are you doing? Oh, I can't tell you that. It's like, well, I can't give you a valuation unless you tell you your revenue numbers. Well, you, you, they said, no, let's, let's come up with a valuation before you give, we give you the revenue. I was like, how does it make sense? Like it's, you know, it's, um, and you know, I walked away thinking they're crackpots and that's it and just cross them off the list, right? So you know, don't, keep your trade, if there's something like a real trade secret, like a real secret source, don't, don't reveal that. You gotta be a bit coy, but you know, things like your revenue numbers and you know, number of you know, transactions per day and whatever like that and the growth rates, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not commercial and confidence numbers, right? I mean, you, you can figure them out. You can scrape a website's um, postings or listings and you can figure out the growth rates. You can do the math. I can walk in and count how many people are in a room working for the company and figure out what the, what the, what the burn rate might be like. I mean, there's ways that you can figure out rough parameters of the business, but um, yeah, if they talk to you, that's great. Get, I mean, one mistake I really did make in my first company, uh, which is more of a VC-backed company, was I spent a lot of time talking to VCs, and I didn't spend any time talking to corp dev people in these big businesses. And that was a big mistake, because you know, I didn't really know what corp dev did, right? And you know, it's, it's important, even if you're early stage, to go and talk to potential acquirers of your business in five, 10 years from now, because you're getting their radar. Right? It's just like I said, go talk to all the investors and make sure that you're going through the pipeline at the same rate. So when a term sheet drops, you've got alternatives. Right? If, you, if you do get a takeover offer, you want to be able to run a process. Right? You don't want to have one guy offer you, you know, 20 million or 50 million or whatever the number is, and then you go, oh, what do I do? Do I take it or you know, what, do I, what do I do? And even if you point an investment bank or corporate advisor to sell a business, you want to make sure that some people actually know who you are, have been tracking you for a little while. So, one thing I suggest you do is once you get a little bit of traction, I mean, I, w I would probably wouldn't do a pre-revenue, but once you've got maybe a million or two in revenue, talk to the bigger players, talk to the guys who might acquire your business down the track. And every once in a while, if you're in the valley or whatever, say, hey, I'm in town, just want to let, let you know how you are. This is where we are. This is the milestones we've hit. We're going to hit a few more milestones down the, you know, in a few more months or in six months or whatever like that. I'll see you next time I'm in town, right? And then they'll get to know you over time. And then who knows, down the track, if an event happens, you can pick the phone up and you can say, or you can give it to the, a list to the corporate advisors and say, here's the 10 guys I've been speaking to for the last three years, put them on your list and you'll, you'll get some traction. And they'll know who you are. No? Yep. Circling back to when you were talking to Deutsche Bank, was it? Yep. They, all of a sudden you're talking about eight times more money, right? Yeah. Did you have to give up eight times as much or was it no. just linear? No, okay. not at all. It's weird. VC maths is really weird. They go, I want between 20% and 40%. They want to have minimum 20% because they kind of think that's you know, one board, board seat out of five. Right, um, most VCs will ask between twenty and twenty and forty. Most angels will ask between ten and seventy percent. Right, uh, I've seen some really weird deals from angels. It turns out you know, angels can be really crackpot. Right, um, but you know they typically think between twenty and forty percent, and they typically think you know if I've got a fund of a, say a hundred million dollars for argument's sake, and I've got two partners, uh, it's going to seven-year fund. that's probably going to be ten million dollars on average per investment. I won't put that $10 million in all at once. I'll do it over, over maybe two or three rounds. So I'll maybe do 2 million, then 4 million, then, then, then you, know, if, you know, if you're going really well, I'll go over the 10. If you're not doing well, I'll just cut you off as soon as I, as soon as I can. Um, but um, that's how they think about things, right? There's a cert certain bandwidth, you know, cognitive bandwidth of the venture capitalist to be able to talk to you and deal with all your crap, right? And all the things that go up and down and, and go to your board meetings and read your board, board papers and mentor you and introduce you to people, et cetera. And, yeah, that, that, that's that's the you know, that's the cognitive limit of a human being. Yeah. So two side marketplace. You got chicken egg, right? The buyers won't come unless the sellers are there. The sellers won't come if the buyers are there. The trick with the two sided marketplace is turned into a one sided marketplace. There is always one side 
of the supply of demand that you'll be able to find somewhere, right? There'll be a directory of you know, shops somewhere, right, that you can scrape, right? Uh, there will be a directory of, I don't know, someone somewhere that you can, you can be one side of that market is usually easy to get and that, e that, that side is usually the supply side. So the people who are selling things, usually there's, it's easy to find them because they make themselves very public and all the contact deals are everywhere. The demand side is the hard side to build. So usually what I would do is focus on the supply side, get a bit of, you know, get that, get that going and then hit the demand side. But it, it, it is tough. I cheated with Freelancer. I already bought a site that had 500,000 users. So I had liquidity in 20 job categories, right? I knew that if I pumped in website jobs or copy, uh, copywriting jobs or um, data entry jobs or um, uh, logo design jobs, uh, graphic design jobs, uh, translation jobs, that they'll get fulfilled, right? And so once I had that, I just focused on building the demand up in those areas and just focus on the, on the conversion optimization of the funnel, right? So just focusing on traffic converting the signups to, you know, posted projects to, you know, bid it on, awarded, accepted, completed, paid in full, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and I, then I structured my whole business so that I had a, a, um, my, my, the, the core strength behind Freelancer is the data science team, right? So we have, I mean, three major groups. We have engineering get things done. Uh, we have customer experience, which is the outward facing side of the company. And we have data science, right? Growth, we call it. And the guys in that group are like mass stats, comp sci, physics, mechatronics, so forth. People like Felix with the very long beards. Uh, absolute genius. Um, and um, these people basically drive the business. They, they, they run the product groups. They, they have all the insights in terms of the, the data and so forth. And, we, and then within that, we structure it so we have a team focused on acquisition, right? And when I say acquisition, I mean customer acquisition. So they're focusing on how do we acquire um, customers, right? And you go through, there's all these different channels you can acquire customers, organic, inorganic. So organic, you've got things like search engine optimization, you've got email marketing. Yeah, you know, you've got PR, you know, press releases, you know, events, whatever, right? You've got um, paid marketing, you've got search engine optimization, display, um, search engine marketing, sorry, um, display advertising, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you have you know, one team focused on acquisition, you have a, then you have a team focused on activation. So once that traffic hits your, hits your site, how do you get activated? In the case of a, a freelancer, uh, once an employer posts a job, we consider them activated because once the job's live, people will be bidding on it and the freelancers take over and do all the you know, sales and please pick me and, and so forth, right? For a freelancer, maybe it's um, select a few skills because once they've selected a few skills and signed up, we will send them emails saying, here's some new jobs related to your skills, right? And we th that's activated, right? And, then, and then, then we have a team focused on revenue optimization. So, um, you know, how do we... You know, how do we convert? How do we convert things maybe um, in, in um, a bit better in some part of some part of a web page, or how do we um, think about pricing or whatever it may be, right? And then we have a team focused on referrals. So you know, you've got a happy customer when they reach a certain level of happiness, get them to bring tell two or three of their friends for some reason, right? So in the case of Zynga, when they played the you know your Cityville or Farmville, you had to kind of have two or three friends to go um, complete a level or, or do whatever in the game, right? Uh, on freelancer, it might be well. You've got a logo designed. Maybe you've done a contest. You've got 20 different logo designs. Email your friends and you get them to help you pick which is the best logo, right? And then one of the friends will go, hey, that's a great logo. Can I go get one too? Oh, yeah, et cetera, and, and so on. Then you have a team focused on um, uh, retention, right? So uh, how do you make sure that people are engaged, that they keep coming back to the site, log in every, couple you know, every two days or every day or whatever, right? And then we have a team focused on resurrection, which is the people have churned. How do you bring them back, right? And uh, it's called the pirate model for startup metrics because it's A A R R R R R, right? <laughs> you won't forget that now. So, yep. Uh, what's your opinion on growing organically via hiring people or growing via acquisition of like uh, you know, buying out an entire team that's already sort of down? Here? Most acquisitions will fail, and they're very very horrible. Um, Acquisition worked out very, very well for us and worked out really cheap, a lot cheaper than um, Greenfield's marketing. And it's only because we're a marketplace and we bought smaller marketplaces. If you're on a marketplace model, right, and you're a CEO of a marketplace business, buy them all, right, for the right price, right? You can, do the, you can calculate the right price because you can look at all your paid channels and you go, what is, what's the CPA of that customer you know, look like typically, right? And then anything below that, I'll buy the competitor because not only do you, do you, do you um, acquire customers uh, in bulk, but you kill a competitor, right? Uh, most marketplaces won't, won't just go bust. If you had some liquidity, at some point someone will buy you, right? I'm constantly hunting for people with, with, with marketplaces that are smaller than mine, right? Not too small. At this point, I'm looking for marketplaces that 
will have a meaningful dent to my revenue. So I'm looking for marketplaces doing, you know, three million plus preferably in revenue, ideally five million in revenue. I might look as low as one million in revenue, but yeah, you know, I'm looking for things of a certain size, but I will buy them all, right? Um, but if you have a normal, you know, like an enterprise software business or what have you, a lot of those, a lot of acquisitions will just fail. I mean, we've, we've bought a bunch of things that aren't direct competitors of ours that we can't just rip down and merge in and shut down, right? And they're really tough. They're really, really, really tough, even when they're good businesses, because you have, you have constant distractions over prioritization of resources. I mean, this is, a classic, this is the classic Kodak disruption theory, you know, resource allocation problem. Kodak invented the digital camera, that whole team working on it. So why did Kodak get killed by the digital camera? Because every time you have a resource allocation meeting, you go, where do I hire, the, I hire another engineer, where do I put them? You put them in the team that's making the money, right? You don't put them in the team that's not making money, right? So when you buy these, you know, we, we, you know when you buy smaller businesses um, uh, that aren't directly things you can merge into your into your core business and shut down, right? Um, uh, you know, you get that liquidity and that volume in, going in. It's very very tough because every time there's a resource allocation meeting, the guys who are running freelancer get the get the resources. The guys who are running the smaller websites, it's, it's tough for them, right? It's a constant challenge. So I would say if you're running a marketplace, buy them all. If you, otherwise, I'd be very cautious about buying, buying businesses. Yep. Um, I'm currently in a time of navigating valuation. Uh, besides for internal knowledge sake, if I'm not going to raise money, mm. do I need to basically figure out my valuation besides for my own sake? Doesn't, it doesn't, it's a matter, if you're not raising money or doing a transaction, it doesn't matter what your valuation is. Right? The answer is how long is a piece of string, right? It's meaningless, right? Um, you may want to uh, provide stock to employees or what have you, but there's, there's other ways in which you can, you can, you can calculate that um, uh, based on, on relative numbers and so forth, depending on what size of stage you are at. But it's otherwise, it's, it's, it's fairly meaningless. I mean, Freelancer had no valuation from uh, January 2009 we had a valuation January 2009. We didn't have a, we were undefined until November 2013. We had no transaction. Everything I bought was, I paid in cash. I had no financing. And part of the reason why I actually did want to raise money in 2013 was, um, you know, bootstrapping is great, but eventually you get a little bit frustrated because your business is actually quite large and you kind of go to yourself, no one really knows how large we are, right? People, some people think you're a startup. Some people know you're a huge company. But no one really knows who you are. So when Instagram sold um, for a billion dollars, and it was, um, uh, was it 551 days old, 13 people, no revenue, we thought, well, we're providing jobs to all these people in the developing world and doing this good in the world, and no one knows how, knows how big we are. It's a bit frustrating. So you know, the, 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 the late stage VCs, they track everything. They know where all the companies are. They know, you know who's doing, who's doing uh, who's of a certain size, et cetera. And they'll be contacting you every quarter with their junior associates going, how's it going, Matt? Just want to check in, you know, what happened this quarter? How'd you go? How did projects go? How did this, you know, project that you're, this product that you're building, how did that go, et cetera? And you know, they'll constantly be flinging term sheets at you, right? Once you get to that stage, right? And um, we got to a point where it's like, you know, maybe we should take a bit of money from someone just to kind of put a little stake in the ground, like a really tiny bit of, of money, like a, you know, sell, you know, seven and a half percent of the company, just a little slither, just to, just to show that this is a valuation stake. Because in the valley, you raise money at a, you, know, you get a white combinator, you get it at a six million convertible cap, you know, convertible note, and you get, get you know, 20 million round, or 50 million round, 100 million round, you just got a crunch base, you know exactly where the business is, right? Well, last we were undefined, right? So I, put, I wanted to put a little stake in the ground. It was kind of funny. I mean, the funny thing about it was that we, we, we had a few term sheets that uh, came in and were kind of interested in uh, one group. So we, we talked the valuation up a, bit, a, a little bit to about 200 million, and I thought, okay, well, um, maybe we'll take that. And then I, I have a fairly big profile in the media in Australia and technology policy. So I kind of talk about you know, structural things that need to happen in the economy in terms of technology. And the Australian Securities Exchange is going mental at the moment. Like if you've got a, if you've got a company right now in Canada and you're doing but, yeah, 1 million in revenue plus, preferably more, but yeah, 3 million, 5 million, there are companies on the ASX in tech that have got a billion, close to a billion dollar valuation with less than a million in revenue. Right, it's going mental, and it's one share, one vote. There's no VCs, there's no um, liquidation preference, etc. You just go out there and you, you either IPO it or you reverse IPO it, and it's just going mental. And the reason why is because the rest of the world is fucked, right? If you look out there, resources is completely screwed, right? The Australian, which is 40% of the market, banking is about to get screwed, which is 40% of the market, 
and investors are searching for yield, they're searching for growth. So there's always a huge amount of money. ASX is the fourth largest equity capital market in the world. It's the same size as NASDAQ. It's just in resources, right? It's a bit like the TSX in some regards. But there's a lot of guys looking for growth. And so people are listing tech at the moment who have got a growth story and, and revenue, even though it's small revenue. <coughs> they're going mental, absolutely mental, seeing huge growth. Anyway, so I thought, I talked a lot about how I, you know, the Australian venture capital industry was stuffed. It never really, it never, it was never really successful in the first dot-com boom. So they never got a Series B, larger funds to go and, um, you know, to to to, um, to get going. So I, I've always said we've got this massive equity um, market in front of us, just like the TSX, where you can take a junior mining company with maybe no um, drill holes in the ground, a dog and a truck, and a PowerPoint presentation. You can go raise a few million dollars. And it's quite simple. You just write a prospectus, which is a business, little, little mini business plan, and off you go. There's no begging for a preferred stock, you know, um, uh, uh, you know telephone directory set, set you know, uh, thick uh, set of documentation and begging down you know, Sand Hill Road. You basically write a business plan. You say, what am I going to do with it? Here's the share price. Are they inv other investing? In they don't invest in it, right? And it's amazing. If we could do that for tech, it would be phenomenal. And so the ASX is right behind this now. There's this huge boom in Australia going right now in tech. So if, you, if you've got a company that's doing over a million, two million, three million, between three and five would be the sweet spot, but you can do it above a million. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are going out there and they've got, you know, this company's doing less than 400K in revenue with a hundred million valuation. There's a company with, there's a company that had a, had a 800 and, it was bigger than us at one point, <coughs> and it had about 400K in revenue. Right, so it's a real boom right now down there because investors are looking for somewhere to, looking for growth stories. Now, a lot of them are going to go belly up and yeah, is it another bubble for me? Yeah, there maybe. Um, but um, it's a great place right now to look, and it's certainly a place where you, where you can look without um, uh, taking money from a VC. Just to end that story up, so I thought I was going to raise a little money from a VC, and then everyone said, why don't you list it, because you're telling everyone this is the future, so put your money where your mouth is, so I did it. And when we're down that path, all the good stuff happens. So the guys who were interested in potentially acquiring us, they all started coming out of the woodwork. We got a, we got a, um, a formal takeover off of $400 million for the business. We were trying to IPO at 200. The takeover offer came in at 400. Uh, we listed it still at 200 and it opened at 1.03 billion on day one. Uh, so I was looking for the share price at 50 cents. It was $2.60. So that was great. So um, anyway, long story. Uh, maybe one or two questions and then wrap it up. Yep. I was wondering about the term sheets. Do in practice, do prior, do investors know of the term sheets of prior investors? Yes, they see, they can see everything. Yeah. Well, because they well the reason why they know is because they look at the doc they can look at the documentation, right? I mean, they get the cap table, it's it's all it's all there. So yeah, they. No, no, it's the golden rule. Who has the gold rules, right? They've got all the money, so yeah. Uh, entrepreneurs, no, people have done it. People have been through it. Um, also, even guys who have done it and, and blown up, right? Like, so um, the entrepreneurs who have failed, right? People have raised money, even multiple companies, because you learn. I mean, I've got, I've got a saying that anyone can hold the rudder when the sea is calm, but when the shit hits the fan, that's when you learn how to sail a boat, right? And um, it's true, right? And so the people who have been through that, they, they've learned a lot. Like, I, I, I kind of say that you've got to go through like three, you know, your third company might be successful if you're lucky, right? First one, you make a lot of mistakes. Second one, you make hopefully different mistakes. And the third one, I mean, Sean Parker, he, Napster, right? Very disruptive. So, you know, disruptive kids get sent to the principal's office. Napster was pretty disruptive, got sent to the principal's office. Plaxo, right? He got uh, pushed out by the VCs. And the third time around, he got lucky with Facebook, right? Um, you know, so talk to entrepreneurs, people preferably in similar domain space to you, like industry space, or similar business model. You know, so yeah, I wouldn't talk to an enterprise software guy if you've got a consumer or a marketplace business, right? But you know, if I, I'm running freelancer, which is a marketplace business, I'll happily talk to someone who's got a marketplace for cars or houses or whatever, because there's a lot of similarities and things. Yep. Yeah. Prior. Yeah. But when you're in the negotiation and say you're negotiating yeah. and you have confidentiality on the yeah. that are on the table, yeah. uh, how fast do you see the negotiations dropped off, if ever, and you're in a good spot and so you don't care? Can you kind of talk about the details of those term sheets that are on the table? Yeah. So, what, I mean, what, it's, it's, you, you, it, 
it's a lot of art as well as science, right? Um, so uh, trying to understand, I think, what, 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 what your question was is um, there's, a, there's, a few, there's a few things here. So um, you, you, just, you just want to get yourself in as competitive position as possible. And if you're not in a competitive position, you want to, you want to time at the clock on them as much as possible, right? So the VCs will have a sunk cost. So the more you spend time with them, the more you spend whatever, they will go into their partner meetings every Monday morning and I go, what did you do this week? Oh, well, I talked to Matt at Freelancer. And it's like, okay, great. Okay, next week, what happened? I talked to Matt at Freelancer. Talk, talk next week. I'm talking to Matt at Freelancer, right? Eventually, after a few months, the partners will go, well, what are you going to do? You're going to invest in this company or what? You're going to like, you know, shit will get off the pot, right? Like, you just, you know? And so, you know, there, there are a bunch of tactics you can use to kind of really, um, even if you may not be in a competitive position, to kind of drag them along and, and drag them out. Um, Okay, so there's a few things. So first of all, don't worry about any of the previous term sheets. Just ignore that, right? Just consist, only consider going forward. If you've got your, fen if you've got your fen Fenwick and West in your back pocket, you can say, well, Ratchet's not, not a market deal, which is not. Ratchet's aren't market deals. Late stage, they're becoming market deals because the unicorn valuation is just stupid. So the investors are saying, why would I give you an investment at a billion dollar valuation? I think that valuation is complete crap. And they go, well, we'll guarantee you, we'll get a good, you know, guarantee you a return of 20% by putting a Ratchet in. Right, because even if it's below a certain below, below your share price, will guarantee you 20% return. Right, so if you have that in your back pocket, right, then what you should do is when you go into the negotiation before you walk in, is you should sit down, right, and you should think, and you, you, you're never really negotiating one point at a time. You're negotiating the whole deal at a time. You remember that. And too many guys get focused on, or girls get focused on, what's the valuation? Let's focus on the valuation. Okay, we've agreed on the valuation. Now let's we'll focus on the other deal points. That's a complete disaster. Right, because VCs are smart enough, they can, t they can tune the whole term sheet, doesn't matter what the valuation number says, right? What you need to do is before you go in, you have a list and you say, first of all, you, list number one is that these are the things you really care about and if you don't get these, you're walking out, right? And, and ahead of time, you agree with your team. If I walk out, if I don't get any of these, I'm walking out and you're not gonna, you won't get the shits with me because this is, this is it, this is the stuff we really care about and we're not gonna compromise on it. If we don't get these things, that's it, deals off, right? And it may be like, you know, you know, that my, you know, I'm the CEO, or it might be that, you know, um, my friend over here keeps his job because sometimes investors will say, we'll fund the company, but that guy's got to get, is out of the team or whatever it may be. So you've got things that, absolutely, list A, the things that if you don't get, you walk away, right? List number, uh, list B are things that are very important to you, but you will trade them for things that are very important to them, right? List, no, list number C are things that are of moderate importance and list number D are things that you don't really care about so much, but you, you, we're not going to just give them up. Because a, a big mistake that, that another startups get into is they go, oh, these things are not important to us, we'll just give them all away, right? And what you do is when you go into the negotiation, you try and trade, right? You try and figure out what's important to them and trade you know, what's important to you for what's important to them. And the way, it's not symmetrical, right? So things, something that you might think is irrelevant might be really important to them but you should treat it as something really valuable to get something really valuable for yourself, right? So there's a whole theory here around negotiation. A little funny anecdote, I, was, I did a couple of negotiation courses, courses at Stanford. Um, not after, I did engineering there, but years later I went back and did some business courses and um, the lady who teaches um, negotiation there is a, a, a lady by the name of uh, Mary Neal. And she used to be, she's a big, buffy, blonde hair from Dallas, Texas, big cowboy boots, uh, whatever. She comes and she goes, I used to be a marriage counselor. And that is the toughest negotiation on the planet, right? <laughs> you take two fundamentally different people who hate each other. And what do they do to make things better? They have a baby. <laughs> and so, uh, and so uh, I became a negotiation professor at Stanford. Anyway, so there's a, there's a, bunch, of, there's a bunch of books. Uh, one's called, uh, I think, ne Negotiating Rationally, Getting Past No, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bunch of books that teach you little tactics in negotiation. But just don't go in, don't go in there and focus on one thing. Go in there and understand where, where your position is on everything and then try and figure out where their position is on everything and try and think, you know, things that they're important to them, trade for things that are important for you. And then do it as a portfolio negotiation, not just as a isolated. Because if you walk in there and go, oh, I'm only focused on the valuation, I'll give up everything else, you'll get screwed, right? And, then, and the other thing is when you do that is make sure that only one person is negotiating, right? So you go tell everyone else in the company, if they call you up, because they will try and do side channels and 
this, that, the other, and play you off against each other, depending on who, you know, how, how credible the VC is or how competitive a position you're in. Um, just make sure it just goes to one person. Otherwise, otherwise, it's a disaster. And if you have investors in your business, and you've done a Series A, and you've got a Series B, make sure all your investors know only one person is doing the negotiation, that's the CEO, right? Otherwise, there'd be side channels to the investors, to investors, and this, that, the other, and, and there, are, there are multiple ways in which you can get in trouble. You're racing all your horses at one time doing that, and you're working all the strategy here and here and here, mm. and you're trying to put that time mm. crunch on them, mm. and you see like, a lot of fall off from the investors. Just like, well, you know, well the, not really. Okay. Not really, because the investors don't really fall off when you lose credibility, really, right? Because what's the opportunity cost for an investor? I mean, investors typically just don't say no, mm -hmm. right? They're, because investors don't want to say no because they don't, they don't want to be the guy that said no to eBay, right? Or SpaceX or whatever, right? So typically investors, they'll kind of be there and they'll be like, ah, oh, well, not sure, not sure, not sure. And they'll, they'll know when you're running out of, they'll see the balance sheet. They'll know what your burn rate is. They'll know when you run out of cash. You know, some will play it to your advantage and they'll just drag the conversation on until you get closer and closer to running out of cash. That's why if you're cash flow positive, even if just a tiny bit cash flow positive, you're in a very strong position because they can't play that game, right? Um, but you know, well, I mean, from an investor perspective, why would you say no? They can just say, oh, not really, not interested, just drag it on, right? No, oh, not, not quite sure, talk to me next week, whatever, you know? And they, may, they may find some other deal and then kind of they're off spending their time on that. That's why you need to kind of keep them really busy all the time. But, um, but they'll really say no just because, uh, unless they've lost, unless they've, you've done something stupid or you've acted irrational or they've, yeah, they spoke to a customer. The customer said, oh, no, I'm not quite sure about this product or whatever. Yeah? How involved are angel investors uh, when you're first going to VCs after your angel round? Are they very involved? Um, angel investors range from really awesome to crazy. Um, I have a really awesome guy who's backing me. I, I call him an angel investor because he, even though he's got a venture fund, it's just venture fund of one. Uh, and even though he's got a lot of money, it's really just one guy. And he's fantastic. Um, but I've also seen absolute batshit crazy angel investors, like batshit crazy, who, who will just, like this, um, this, this example I, I, ha I had here where the investors didn't want the um, startup to travel overseas to raise Series B, they were angel investors that um, vetoed the travel budget and they were batshit crazy. So yeah, you have to be careful angels. Um, and typically the deals you get from angels are, can, be, can be really bad, they can be, you know, you, you're taking a very small amount of money and there's a whole bunch of complicated terms that come in. And the complicated terms come in mainly because um, from, from angels that aren't sophisticated, that aren't entrepreneurs, they're just, they've got some money and they're doing investments and they just have these really complicated term sheets because they haven't been an entrepreneur and they don't, don't understand how these things work. So they put the control mechanisms in. Any more questions or are we gonna, okay, I'll keep, I'll keep answering until you tell me to get off. Tell yeah. Yeah. There's been acquisition, I think it's Odesk, Desk, and... Uh, Elance and Upwork. Elance, Elance and Odesk merged and became Upwork, uh, yeah. which hasn't gone very well for them. They've changed CEOs twice in the last 12 months. And uh, if you look at Twitter at the moment, they're trying to get downwork trending uh, because it's been down for the last five days. Um, uh, I, I won't get into that in too much detail in terms of what's going on there. But um, look, wh what I think is when I started this business, um, the way it started, again, there's a video on YouTube called Sunrise, Matt Barry. It's a Sunrise Conference. It's a, it, it's a, I think it's a phenomenal video because I go through, I go, it's a pictorial essay of starting off with one guy in the room and what happened next. And then what happened next and what happened next. And, what, and it's like two guys in the room. And what were we doing? We're doing this, this, this. And what happened then? And then, then we did this. And then we had three people in a room, and then we, et cetera. And it's, so people who are really, really early stage, they can really... It just like, it relates to them because they go, okay, this is the stage I'm at. I've got two people in a room. We're doing this. We're doing ten thousand a month in revenue. What do we do? What, what should we do next? And I kind of show this is what we did, and this worked, and this didn't work. Then we did this, and it just, you know, it's the it's the power of compound returns, right? Like it takes off. But um, early on, my when I when I looked at freelance, and the reason why I bought that business was, I was I was looking for something to do, and I was sitting at home, and I was pretty broken, and I didn't have, um, I was I was you know, pretty much broke. And uh, all my friends are working in the company I walked out of. And all the VCs uh, hated me because when I walked out, I said, I thought what one, of them, what one of them was doing is a little bit unethical. So I said to them, if you're going to do this, I will just walk out and I'll consider this my $30 million MBA. Right? And they didn't like that very much. And so I was a bit of a pariah. And um, 
I thought, well, what do I do, right? I'm at home, I don't want to work for another company. Um, I've got to do another business. I can't hire any of my friends because already, I've already hired them all. They're all still working over there and I walked out on them. Um, I don't, can't raise any money from venture capitalists, so what do I do? So I was sitting at home, I took some time off, went skiing Whistler, and um, it's one of us here, and I uh, thought, okay, what, what can I do next? And I was you know, helping a few people with some side projects, you know, building little websites for them and so forth. I did electrical engineering, computer science and so forth, and could program. Couldn't do design, uh, but I could program things. And um, you know, one particular thing, I was building a website, uh, and I needed to build a, a directory of shops. You know, name of the shop, phone number, address, URL. And the theory being that if, you know, this, this um, co the company that was selling things wholesale had a directory of shops on it, the shops that weren't buying from them would want to be in the directory and that's how they could, you know, if they sign up there, we can market to them, etc. So I had to fill in a spreadsheet of information. It was like, you know, a thousand rows and a bunch of columns. And I thought this is really boring. So I'll get someone's little brother or sister to do it for me. And I'll pay him $2,000, I give him $2 per row, just name of the shop, whatever, and you just have to Google, Google the names. And I thought someone will love it. And I went out to find a little brother or sister of a friend of mine to do the work, and it was inc incredibly frustrating. I, I, that worked for a few hours. They say, this is really boring. I said, of course it's boring. That's why I'm paying you $2,000. Otherwise, I'll do it if it's interesting work. Uh, and uh, it's not the sort of job you can go post on a job board or anything like that. And get, this is like 2007, right? So, um, so what do I do? So in frustration after four months, I said, bugger this. I went to the internet, typed in cheap data entry, and up popped a site called Get a Freelancer. And I went to it and it looked like Craigslist. It looked terrible. It was like designed with leftover paint from the USS Midway. It was just this gray <laughs> mess of shit, right? And I went there, I go, what is this? And I didn't know, I posted a job saying I want someone to do this data entry. I'll pay $2,000 for it. And I walked away at lunch and I actually forgot I posted the job. And I came back and my email box, uh, in inbox had uh, 74 emails. I'll do it for 2,000, 1,500, 400, 300, 200, $100. And I thought, what the fuck? What the hell's going on in my inbox? And I thought, there's no way. First of all, I was like, no way 74 people want to do the job. I can't find anyone, right? And I thought, no way someone's do it for $100. This, is, this, this can't be real. This is like I don't know, a scam or something. I don't know what this is. And so I thought, oh, well, bugger it. I'll give it a go, $100. And I hired this team in Vietnam, and the job was done in three days, and it was perfect. And I only paid until the job was done. And I thought, Jesus Christ. I thought, this just solves so many problems for me. I can hire an army here with my credit card sitting in my underwear and not have to hire any of my friends. I can build a billion dollar business just sitting at home, right? And uh, I thought, this is just incredible. I thought, what sort of business do I build? And I kind of thought about it. I thought, gee, well, I think this business is really amazing. I should get into this industry. Surely this is huge. What is, it's like a global marketplace for jobs. It's like, it's like an eBay for jobs, right? I thought, well, gee, eBay is a big company. You've got eBay, you've got Amazon, now you've got Alibaba. They're you know, global marketplaces for products, right? I thought, surely, Global marketplace for services is kind of like a really big category that people have forgotten about. And so I thought, okay, I'll get into the space. And I didn't, I didn't think, you know, a few years later, I'd be running a business almost at a billion dollar market. Well, it was a billion dollar market, almost a billion market capital. Right? Um, I just thought I can definitely, you know, build something that gets to a certain level. And I did a bit of a survey of the space. And there's hundreds of guys who were trying to do this, right? Um, uh, around the world. And I, um, I thought, well, okay, I did a little bit of a business plan. A little trick that you should do is I did a little back of the envelope calculation where I go, how do I make a million dollars in revenue? And that, that, that's a really good calculation you should do for your business if you haven't done it because you know, how, what's the price point of the product? How many times does a customer buy? Do they pay monthly? Do they buy once a year? Do they buy once and that's it? You never see them again, you know, et cetera. What does that mean in terms of the math? How many units do I have to sell to make a million in revenue a year? And then you do the math and you go, Okay, to make a million profit a year, what does that mean? So how many salespeople do I need? What sort of infrastructure do I need, et cetera? And, you do, and that just tells you, very quickly, you can, do, you can figure out, is this going to be a real business or, or, or impractical business? Do I need 10,000 salespeople to make a million dollars, which is stupid? Or you know, is it going to work? And I thought, well, um, and I built a site called bititout.com, and I was hiring freelancers off Get a Freelancer to copy Get a Freelancer. So they were, um, I could do the programming, but I was hiring designers to do design and you know, copying this site, basically, with the site. And then I thought to myself, no one's got, there was about 12 businesses that had some traction, but none had really set the world on fire back in 2007. And I thought, well, no one's going to fund me to be number 13, so maybe I should buy rather than build. And I thought that's, that appeals to me because I can buy something that's doing a million in revenue. I can, that first million is just so tough that you know, I, can, I can, the six years I spent on my last company, that got to about two and a half million in revenue. 
right? I can kind of short circuit that and just start on day one making with a million in revenue and kind of try and earn back some of the years I've lost in the previous company. Because I, 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 I didn't have any regrets about my last company, right? It was, a, it was a $30 million MBA. I just wish it took three years instead of six years, right? And so um, I asked a bunch of guys uh, who were in the space if they wanted to sell. A few of them said yes. I said, send me the information. And ironically, the best website out there was Get a Freelancer because Get a Freelancer had the most traffic. And the way that it had the most traffic was it had the best SEO. And it's exactly the same way I found it. I typed in cheap data entry on Google, and there it was. You type in Web Developer India, and there it was, right? So it was dominant on that, that, that acquisition strategy of SEO. And so I looked at it, and I thought, well, gee, I can actually buy this business for less than I was going to raise. I was going to raise about $4 million to get going, right? I can buy this business for less than that, already have half a million users, already have a website that looks like crap, but I can optimize it. And it was great because I could see all these problems with it, right? And when I could see a problem, I go, well, if I fix that, this will be better. If I fix that, that will be better. And that's the beginning of our growth team, the, 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 the ethos where we have, which is all about conversion optimization, right? You know, this here, this is really inefficient. If I improve that, I'm pretty sure the traffic will improve, right? And, and so, long story cut short, but I said to the guy, listen, I'll, I'll give you what, what you want for it, or I'll help you sell it to the next guy for twice the price. Um, and I put an option agreement in place. I got him to sign that, and I went out there and I tried to raise the money. And it was long, a story in itself. It's another talk altogether, but um, got the business, and then I just started fixing things. Changed the, the, the black and white to Technicolor, right? I got a friend of mine in New York to design a skin, and I just programmed it in, and the revenue doubled, right? Because people were going to the site going, what the fuck is this site? And all of a sudden, it was like, looked a little, it's still a pretty awful looking site, but it's like, oh, it's in color. Okay, I'll give it a go, right? And there's fixing things up, fixing things up. And every time I did that, the revenue just kept on spiking, right? And then I just hired more people. And then, you know, every time I did something, I made sure that, um, you know, it was, it, it was you know, every dollar I spent was, was um, going to make a dollar back. And um, this led to the whole philosophy around uh, freelancer, which is, uh, and there's talks online from Will Exclaimer about this, about, you know, growth, conversion optimization, A-B testing, funnel optimization, you know, pyrometric startups and so forth. So that's... What we do all day now is we run 30 or 40 A-B tests per day. A lot of them will fail, it's, you know, grinding out a few percentage in the funnel, you know, and just, you know, we have a, we have a, a screen now with about 4,000 graphs on it uh, where, we, you know, I can tell you <coughs> during this talk how many $5 English exams are sold in Pakistan, for example. Right? I'm sorry to do this. Yep. Didn't answer the question. It was great, great yep. to hear all that, though. But um, I'm interested. Well, I'm interested. Yeah, well, I, I, so, so I, I partially answered the question. The partial answer to the question is, um, it's an eBay for jobs, right? Global marketplace of services. You know, you've got businesses the size and scale of eBay, Alibaba, Amazon, 70 billion, 120 billion, 277 billion, whatever they are now. Um, I think the global marketplace for products, for services can be just as big, right? Uh, the human labor market, 7.1 billion people on the planet. Uh, about 3 billion of them are on the internet. Um, the other 4 billion are about to connect to the internet. They all want a better job. We help them go from $10 a day to $10 an hour or more. At the same time as we empower small business to compete in the internet world, right? You need to build a website. How do you do that? Do you to hire full-time staff? Or can you just hire someone online to do it, right? For a fraction of the price and so on. So I think it's, it's really, it's ultimately ought to be an international um, platform for micro trade. So, um, you know, you, you want, you're a small business entrepreneur. You want to sell something online or, um, you know, get something built, etc. You can do it through Freelancer. You've got a whole team, a whole virtual army of people. And then we bought escrow. That's our PayPal. So eBay had PayPal. Amazon, Amazon uh, Payments, um, uh, Alibaba, Alipay, and uh, escrow.com is the PayPal to freelancer. And it's very important once you get to a certain stage as a marketplace that you own a payment system because if you don't, you'll get backdoored. You know, when Facebook went to Brazil, they had no, no penetration. <coughs> Orkut was number one in Brazil because a Brazilian engineer added a few friends. All the content was in Portuguese. Went crazy sideways into, in, in, into Brazil. And so um, all the Americans, when they joined Orkut, which was you know, Google Plus before Google Plus, um, would go, why would I go here? It's all Portuguese, right? But when Facebook went to enter, they had no penetration. So the way that Facebook did it was it bought the payment processor for Vostu. Vostu was a clone of Zynga. So Zynga uh, had all these games, City Bill, Farm Bill, et cetera. Um, Vostu was a clone, one-to-one. -one. In fact, the games were so similar, they were copies of each other, right? Bought the payment process. The payment process knew exactly what games people were paying for, what they were doing, purchase history, and had better customer information than Orca did. Because when you go to a social network, you maybe put in Mickey Mouse, maybe you put in your birth date, maybe you don't, right? But uh, when you have a payment system, you put in your full name, address, billing information, 
and so on. So you get much better payment information on the customer. So you, you backdoor, backdoor the whole, whole industry. So you need to own the customer way to the endpoint, uh, ultimately, when you get certain sizes of the marketplace. Not early stage, but large. Oh, so I have 470 internal employees okay. in about eight countries. Um, and then we hire hundreds of freelancers uh, for all sorts of things. So was it tough to, to hire internally just because of the price differences between? Uh, well, I, I, we, we hire in multiple geographic uh, locations. So we have our offices in Sydney, uh, Manila, which is very low cost, Vancouver, um, Rancho Santa Margarita in California, where the escrow offices are, uh, Buenos Aires, London, uh, Jakarta. And so we, we arbitrage some of the costs away um, <coughs> by just being smart about where we put our offices for various functions. Yeah, we've got uh, about 300 staff in the Philippines, uh, two floors. Um, we own, the, I mean, it's our, our, own, our, own, um, our own outfit, so it's not the BPO or anything like that. We, we've incorporated there. We have a whole management team there. And it's about, um, about 80 or so engineers now as well. Which, are, which actually turned out really well. We've got about 110 people in Sydney, which are, include engineers, product design, et cetera. We've got a team here, which is growing rapidly and hiring. Um, put your hands up if you're from France or Vancouver. We've got a data science team and a, and a systems engineering team and, and, a, and a, a recruiter uh, team uh, in, um, uh, in Vancouver. Uh, but yeah, we're kind of careful about where, where we put people, et cetera. But we use France as wherever we can. Sure. Yeah.